Well, we never really got into any trouble with the police growing up. Except when we came to the attention of the English constabulary. Late one night, when me and my friend Tom arrived outside Buckingham Palace. I was pushing my friend Tom in a supermarket trolley at the time. Now we happened to be in London during the day of Princess Diana's wedding and we couldn't get home because of the massive crowds and the traffic there. The whole city was a standstill and it was a long walk for us lads to get back to the city centre. So we borrowed a supermarket trolley and we each took it in turns to push the other along the mall outside Bucko Pally. The English bobbies were quite polite at the time and a big van full of them pulled up alongside of us and they all jumped out and put on their big long hats. One of the bobbies said to us, Hello, hello, hello. Well, where would you be going then at this time of the night in that unauthorised vehicle? Well, they couldn't really issue us with a, a parking ticket, could they? So London was like an experiment. We were young and ambitious and we just wanted to say that we'd been there and done it wore the shirt and all that thing. But I have to be honest, I never really took to the city. I always thought it was a very big, anonymous and lonely place. And it must have been very hard for people living there long term. Anyway, I returned to Cork in December 1981 for that Christmas holiday. And for some reason, I felt that I should give my old friend Brendan a call there to see what he had been up to since I'd last seen him. I went to his home on the north side of Cork where he told me that he had become a born-again Christian. What's all that about, I thought. Well, Brendan explained that God had come into his, his life and that he'd seen the light and was now a follower of Jesus Christ. He gave me a little Gideon's Bible to read. I was curious at the time, so I said I'd take it and check it out. And... We went off on Brendan's motorbike to visit a local Christian church in Cork. It was the Upper Room, and at the time it was based in Camden's Quay, the city centre. Now, as children, we were brought up as Catholics. Now, we certainly were not fanatically religious or anything like that. But I always had an interest in things spiritual, and sometimes I'd go into a church building. To be honest, it was more for a bit of peace and quiet than anything else. So Brendan's conversion was all new to me, but still I knew there was something happening in his life. And he began to explain to me that he wasn't into religion anymore, but that he now had a personal relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. So during that Christmas holiday, I began to reflect on my past year in the big city of London and on the sheer emptiness of life over there. I saw many, many thousands of people coming and going every day on the London underground tube stations, many people alone and anonymous, just following the crowd. I thought, what a life to live. So I stayed in Cork for that Christmas period of 1981, but I still had the desire to explore the music scene as a musician myself, and I went over to Leeds, where I'd spent my younger life, and I went to stay with my aunt Chris there, and that was in January of 1982. And I began to do some gigs in working men's clubs over there. I teamed up with a musician named Bob, and he was into yoga, meditation, and all other sorts of stuff. We played a lot of gigs in working men's clubs around Leeds and Yorkshire, and we often got home late at night after a long motorway drive. It was a bit strange, really, because I was doing what I'd always dreamed about doing, but it had all become very meaningless, a bit like the writer of Ecclesiastes when he says that it, it's like a chasing after the wind. In September of that year, I received a letter from my sister Sandra, who was over in Cork, and she told me that she had also met my friend Brendan and that he had brought her to a Bible study and that she now had also become a born-again Christian. So I began to wonder what this fellow Brendan was up to. Was he trying to convert the whole lot of us or what? Anyway, I later realised that it, it wasn't Brendan 
but it was actually God who was in pursuit of me. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to know him. So Sandra wrote to say that she was coming to stay with us in Leeds for a while, and after she arrived, she began to attend a local Christian church not far from where we were staying at my aunt's house. The name of the church at the time was Emmanuel Pentecostal Church. Now I still had the Gideon's Bible which Brendan had given to me and I continued to read chapters every now and again from it. I was still curious about those Christian people and in September 1982 in Leeds I got involved a little bit more with Emmanuel Church. I started going along with my sister, Sandra. And not, a, not too long after joining the church, we were invited to an evangelistic crusade on Woodhouse Moor. And that was in late October. An evangelist came to visit Leeds, and his name was Louis Palau. And for about 10 nights, he held a major crusade up there on the moor. And I went along to all the meetings and I was just so inspired by the preaching because I'd never heard anything like this before. What struck me more than anything was how friendly everybody was and how grateful they were to God. I was very encouraged by the ministry during the Palau Crusade and I began to think seriously about my own life. I was 24 years old. What was I going to do with my future? Would I stay in Leeds? Would I go back to Cork? I knew something in my heart was prompting me. I felt it could have been the Holy Spirit was leading me into a desire to get deeper and more serious about God and his word. Perhaps it was time to settle down instead of running to and fro, chasing my elusive dreams. Here's the words of a song I wrote not long after that period of time. Maybe I ought to move away to a sunny place where it won't ever rain. But I know when I get there that I'll still be the same. There's no changing me. I planned to run away, but I heard a voice saying, Hey, you're just wasting all of your time. Why do you spend your life always running away? Now you've come so far, you know, there's nowhere else to go but to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. With him, you'll be safe. Well, anyway, I prayed and I asked God for wisdom and, and I realised as I read more of his word in that little Gideon's Bible that I needed him not only to direct my paths, but also to forgive my sins. In October 1982 at 39 Harold Road in Leeds, I committed my life to Jesus Christ. And I was ready at that stage to give up everything to follow God even the music scene and the desire for success in the music business. I stopped gigging in the pubs and clubs completely and I made a decision to join a Christian church. I, I even bought all the Louis Palau tapes of his preaching and I made dozens of copies for all the friends that I knew. Bob the bass player thought that I'd gone mad and that I was hypnotised by Louis Palau. He said I was throwing away an opportunity to build a career in music. But the Bible says that, and asks the question, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his very own soul? You can have all this world has to offer, but without Christ, you will still be wretched, poor and blind. So God began to show me a better way. And I began serving God in the local church, which was Emmanuel in Leeds at the time. Uh, and I was getting involved in the, in the worship and even writing and recording my own Christian songs. It seemed such a long way from the days of the brush handle guitar, which I used to play in front of the mirror. That was my air guitar. In God's family, there is nobody who can say I'm not needed there. Everyone can sing, Jesus brought me in. I'm so glad I'm part of God's family. Sometime after the Louis Palau Crusade had ended, I decided to return to Cork and to continue my life journey and my Christian life there. So Sandra and I arrived in Cork in January 83 and we joined the Upper Room Christian Fellowship. And with a guitar in one hand and a Bible in the other, we were ready for Ireland. Not quite, but uh, we did do a lot of street outreaches and evangelism with the church around local towns and villages. And it was all very exciting in those days. Because for the upper room, sharing the gospel 
was a major priority. And so it was great training for me at the time as a very young Christian. Every Saturday morning, a team would head off with guitars and loudspeakers and amplifiers for the street preaching. And you could end up anywhere. You could end up at the Rose of Tralee Festival. You could end up in Yall. You could be anywhere from Cork to Donegal. But one thing was for sure, the gospel had to go out across the land of Ireland. And as I said, about great days. Looking back, I'd have to say it was always challenging to, to be there in the middle of Cork City Centre on a Saturday afternoon with a group of Christians because you'd be sure that all your family would turn up wanting to know what is that fella up to now. But one thing is certain, and that is, as the psalmist proclaims in Psalm 84, better is one day in the courts of God than a thousand spelt anywhere else. Here are the words of another tune that I made up around that time in 1983. Last Saturday we saw them preaching in the town, and who do you think was there? Why, it's your man with the Bible living down the street. He's even gone and cut his hair. They were singing and talking about Jesus and all the things that he can do. They say that they are born again, but I don't know. I only wish that I was too. How can anyone be born again? Is this really what you're saying? How can anyone be born again when he has grown so old? Jesus said, you must be born again. Don't be surprised at what he's saying. It doesn't matter if you're old or grey. You must be born again. So, as I said, we had many great times doing these outreaches up and down the country, singing and sharing the gospel. Uh, but there were some tough times ahead uh, for our family because in April of 1985, uh, my sister Sandra, who had led me to the church initially and who had sang and worshipped with me many times, uh, was diagnosed with a very serious illness. And in August of that year, she went to be with her saviour after a short illness at the age of 24. She had a great passion for life, for Christ and for his people. And as in life, she was the same throughout her illness. Full of humour, full of faith, we shall meet again on that beautiful shore. Here's a little song that I wrote back in 83. Um, and really, this was the, I suppose, this is a song that we sang many times in various places. But um, th the last time we sang it was at a, a conference in Wexford. And the words are very simple. It's sim they say, Jesus, lovely Jesus, how I wandered so alone. Till you touched my heart with your words and promises. Gave a brand new start, made me born again. Jesus, healing Jesus, you have taken all my sins away. With a touch of your hand, there is mighty healing. And nothing can fill my heart but you. You might say, having listened to my story, that we were just ordinary, simple folks, and you're dead right there. We were not exactly part of the mafia or anything else like that. In fact, I never really considered myself a big sinner, whatever that means. Me and my friends and buddies, we could have sailed on through life without a care for God or for the life after this. At the time, it didn't matter. We, would, we just lived for the weekend and a bit of fun, the dancing at the weekends and the discos and everything. We didn't realise that like everybody else, we were on the broad road and we were heading for a lost eternity, separated from God. But I praise God today that he led me to the narrow path which leads to life. I wonder which road you are travelling on today. Read some scriptures in the Bible if you want to find out for sure. And one of the books I would encourage is Matthew in chapter 7. Verses 13 to 14, Matthew chapter 7. So anyway, I thought it was a, a good sort of a guy, fairly spiritual, not out to harm anyone, um, you know, fairly good living and everything. I didn't realise that the Bible said that we were all like sheep who have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way and we all need a saviour to bring us back to God. And his name is Jesus. We need Jesus to save us from our sins. Thank God today that though you are a sinner just like me, you can receive the grace of God into your life and you can know forgiveness and peace 
and that you have eternal life with Christ to be with him forevermore. That's a great assurance to have as you travel through your life is to know that you have that life after with him and that your sins are forgiven. So God didn't ask us to change our religion and become Protestants or Catholics or any other type of institutionalized religion. In fact, Jesus said, unless you change and become like a child, it's, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. That's why we sang that song, you must be born again. Because Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship, it's a, a new life in Jesus Christ. He came to seek you because he loves you. Praise God, Jesus has made a way for you to come back to him. And you know, the funny thing is, it seemed like wherever I went, there was always a Christian there, right there in my face, to continually remind me of this great love that God has for every one of us. And I believe this message is another reminder to you, my dear friend, that he still waits for your response. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing at the door of your heart today. And if you open the door of your heart, he will come in and he will have friendship with you forever. In closing, I would, of course, thank God for my wonderful family, for my wife and all my children. And for my friend, Brendan, for my sister, Sandra, for godly men like Luis Palo and my pastor at the upper room, Tony Simpson, and for many other people who have helped me along this journey of faith that still continues today. But most of all, I thank God for his son, Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here are some words that I wrote to a song many years ago, and the song was written by Simon and Garfunkel, and it's called The Sound of Silence. And these are my words, and basically they tell the story of the Easter period that we celebrate and of the trial of Jesus before Pilate. The question being, what will you do with Jesus? It's a decision that we must all make in our lives, whether we accept or reject him will have eternal consequences, the Bible says. What will you do with Jesus? Who is this man they call the king? Come on, bring him in. Is it true what the people say? That you come with a mighty claim. Are you Jesus, the king of the Jews? What shall I do with this man, Jesus? Some stood up and testified with their accusations and their lies. But Jesus told them who he really was, as there in silence he could see his cross. As the crowd yelled, crucify him, Pilate thought it through. What shall I do with this man, Jesus? I'll wash my hands, I want no part. But Pilate knew deep in his heart that no grave could contain this man, the very sky could fall at his command. Yet he gave him away to the crowd in exchange for a man they knew. What would they do with Jesus? Well, they took him to a place, they struck his head, spat in his face, put a crown of thorns upon his head, made him carry up his cross to death to be hung with sinners, though sin he hadn't won. What have they done to the King, Jesus? Well, on the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he hung on the cross, the sky turned black and the curtain tore in two, as he hung with sinners for sinners like me and you. What will you do with this man, Jesus? So anyway, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. So I want to encourage you to read the scriptures for yourself. I still have that old Gideon's Bible given to me by my friend Brendan. And I encourage you today to begin reading God's word. You may even have one somewhere in the house. A Bible that you'd never discovered before is in your house. Start with a chapter of John's Gospel. Start with chapter 1 
and certainly, definitely read chapter 3 of John's Gospel. And as you do so, continually remain open and repentant before God. Ask him as you read the scripture for his will to be done in your life. Reflect upon his words written also in Isaiah in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53 and Romans chapter 5. And you'll see how much God loves you and what he has done for you in sending Jesus. That's really how my faith started to increase. It wasn't through long and loud preaching from a pulpit, but from the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit and by looking and meditating on God's word. But you will need to connect with Christian people who are committed believers, people born again of God's Holy Spirit, who will encourage you and pray with you and you know nurture you along the Christian faith as you grow. But always remember, no one is perfect. No one is perfect except Jesus. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my little story and some of those songs that I shared are extracts from CDs that I've made, which if you wish, I can send you a copy free with my songs written on and, and recorded on those. You can also contact, contact me on the Facebook page, Charles Ward Facebook, and also on our Facebook church page, which is Mahan Community Church. Mahan Community Church, which is based in Cork City in Ireland where we live. So again, thank you very much. I pray that God would bless you in your life as you seek him and as you seek to serve him in your generation.